Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the word of God that is the truth. We receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for bringing revelation. We will take hold of it. We thank you that we will be doers of it. Thank you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to begin to share with you on the subject of covenants. We've talked about a lot of important messages in the past but this is an extremely important message for you to understand. The name of our Bible has two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is a testament? A testament is a covenant. That's what it's all about. You must understand covenants. We see the prophecy as we begin in Jeremiah 31, the prophecy that was given in the Old Testament, saying in verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with them fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant, my covenant, they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law on in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people." And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God makes covenant in his dealings with man. And here it speaks of the prophecy of bringing forth the new covenant. We must understand about covenants. A covenant is that which is made by making a agreement between party parties that is unbreakable, that is the strongest agreement that can be made known unto man. And the word here, covenant, really goes back to a word that refers to cutting a covenant, which they cut a covenant through blood sacrifice, the shedding of blood. It's ratified by the blood, a blood covenant. It is a binding agreement between two parties. It cannot be broken. It is a, the penalty of it is actually death. The per, it's a permanent agreement. It is sealed by the blood of both parties. It's unbreakable, perpetual. It is the strongest agreement that is possible to make. And we see the fact that when we talk about covenant, we must understand that God has made a covenant with us. We have come into that when we have received Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, when well, we've come into the new covenant. And what a covenant means is everything that I have is yours and everything that you have is mine. That's quite a statement. That's what a covenant's all about. Everything that I have is yours and everything that you have is mine. And you see, the Word of God is just full of covenant statements. In fact, it's all about covenant relationship. We see here in Proverbs 23, 26, an example. He said, My son, give me thine heart. That's what we do. We give unto him because everything that we have, we give unto him. And let thine eyes observe my ways. God will reveal his ways and show us the ways to walk in so we can walk in fellowship with him and see his blessings come to pass. You are to give yourself 100% unto the Lord and walk in the ways of the Lord. It is absolutely of paramount importance. Sorry, this got off track. We see over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, we see quite a statement. And that he died for all, that they which live, which are those that are born again, should not henceforth live unto themselves. If you've come into covenant relationship with God, you give everything you have to Him, and He gives everything He has to you. You cannot live unto yourself, or it's a denial that you've come into covenant relationship with Him. You do not live unto yourselves any longer, but you live unto Him which died for them and rose again. That is important to understand. That means there's no room for pride, there's no room for selfishness, there's no room for rejection of the Word of God and not walking in line with the Word. We must put the Word of God first place. You give out to God, God will give back to you. 
This is why we praise and worship God. We praise and worship Him, minister unto Him, and He ministers back unto you. Everything that you do unto God will then cause Him to do something back unto you. God deals with man's through, man through covenants. And it's a revelation of God's purpose, His will, of what He will do for those who are in covenant relationship with Him. A covenant is also a legal instrument spiritually. It is a legal guarantee that what God has promised that He absolutely will perform. We can see this declared in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Speaking about Jesus, it says, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. This word surety, when you look it up, you look it up in the lexicons, it literally means that you're under good security, guaranteeing the fulfillment of the covenant promises. Jesus is the guarantor of the fulfillment of the promises of the New Testament. He absolutely guarantees that he will bring this to pass. That's what a surety is. In fact, they call insurance companies sureties, some of them, which are guarantors, guaranteeing uh, that they're going to perform what you have come into co to relationship with them in, in insurance contracts. God wants us to understand that a covenant is that which is unbreakable from God's standpoint. It is what your responsibility is, is to carry it out. It's the will of the two parties. So when you came into a relationship with him, we need to understand we came into a covenant with him. You know, that's not preached very often. They say, just receive Jesus, get born again, get your ticket to heaven kind of attitude. We should be bringing forth. You are coming into covenant relationship with God, which means you're giving yourself totally unto him, and he is giving himself totally unto you. You do all that he says, and he will perform everything that he says he will do for you. Well, the new covenant was made between the Father and the man, Christ Jesus. And he came and he accomplished this great work, and now you and I enter into that the same way that Jesus accomplished this, which was through new birth. That's how he came into it. In Hebrews chapter 9, we see something that's important. Jesus went to the cross to bear our sins, to bear them away, to accomplish redemption, but also to bring forth the ratification and the manifestation of the New Testament. <laughs> Hebrews 9.15, For this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called, which is all men, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, if they meet the conditions, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Jesus could not make a will with the Father and then just see it come into force unless he died, because the person who makes the testament or the will has to die before it comes into force. There has to be the death of the testator. Jesus had to become like man in the state of spiritual death, which he did by taking all the sins of mankind upon him and he went down to hell for three days and three nights, bearing it away, and he was the firstborn from the dead, and bringing forth this first, the way to come into covenant relationship, which is by spiritual birth. You gotta be born, that's why you have to be born again. There are two births, a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Then he goes on and says, for where a testament, for a testament is of force after men are dead, Otherwise, is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Jesus died, and then he was born from the dead. He's the firstborn of all creation. We see over in Colossians chapter 1, it says in verse 15, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every or all creation, as Young's brings out a better translation of this. He now also has founded the church. He's the head of the body of the church who's the beginning, the first born from the dead. Jesus was born from the dead. That's exactly what happens to you. You get born from the dead also. Now, the way a covenant works from God's standpoint is he will perform it absolutely when the conditions are met. There are conditions to a covenant, and that is extremely important for you to understand. We see God's attitude about a covenant in Judges chapter 2, verse 
1. The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I have said, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. God will never break his covenant. You can absolutely count on him to perform his covenant with you. That's the way he deals with man, remember. He will never break his covenant. And then he goes on and says, You shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You throw down their altars. You have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? These guys had disobeyed and were walking in these ways and being disobedient to him. And of course, curses, all kinds of curses came upon them because they did not do what God told them to do. If we don't meet the conditions, we won't see the covenant promises to come to pass. And this is so important. Many people are waiting for God to do something without having met the conditions. Or they're expecting that, well, God's in control of all things, so he'll just do such and such. No, he won't. He's only going to do it when you meet the conditions. Psalms 89, we see over in verse 34. My covenant will I not break, he says, nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. His word doesn't change. His word is the truth. He doesn't alter these things. He will, meet, he will never break his covenant and he will perform his word exactly. So you can know exactly what God will do and you know exactly what you are supposed to do. Another thing about God's attitude towards covenant, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, nor destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. This word forget is more not just talking about he forgot about it. It really comes down to forgetting, ignoring, or ceasing to care. It has this understanding in the Hebrew. Forget, ignore, or cease to care. It's like he just doesn't just dis disregard it. No, he pays attention to it. He is not going to ignore his covenant. When you do what he says, he will perform it. He will bring forth his mercy, his blessings upon you because you have met conditions and you can absolutely have faith and assurance beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will perform his word. We see another scripture over in Psalms 111, verse 5. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. This word mindful means to remember, to recall, or call to mind. He will never not remember his, his covenant. He always is remembering it. He's mindful of it. He's ready to perform it. He's watching over it. You must understand that. That's how you can know what God will do when you understand covenant relationship. You can come to absolute true faith and know what he will do. Trust in him. But you've got to understand covenant relationship. At the same time, we see over in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 72, it speaks here of us being saved from our enemies in the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant. This tells us something else about the covenant. God's covenant is holy. His covenant is holy. You need to treat his covenant as holy. You need to treat the word of God as the holy word of God. It is the holy scriptures that we are going to take heed to it, and do what he says. And remember, he remembers it. This particular word in the Greek refers to how the same thing, how he reminds us of it. Or he turns one's mind to something. He will keep his mind upon the things of his word, and he will respond to it. We see an example over in Exodus in the Old Testament. Chapter 2, verse 24. God heard their groaning about the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, that he would bring them out of the bondage and he would bring them into the land. God had set this as a covenant promise. He heard them and he remembered his covenant. He responded to it. God remembers his covenant. This is why 
What do you bring to him? You bring the word to him because that's the word of the covenant. Do you pray your problem? Never. That's not going to solve anything. You bring the word that's the answer that he will perform as you have met the conditions. We see another place. Exodus chapter 6, verse 4. He said, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I remembered my covenant. God is a covenant-keeping God. And notice it says he establishes it. This particular word refers to the fact that he has completed this covenant action relationship with man and through what the covenant that he's made in the past and he will absolutely perform it. He will carry it out. He will give effect to it. He will bring everything that he says to pass. And that's what we need to understand. It's binding upon him, but it's also binding on all those that enter into it. It's not a one-way street. We have responsibilities to walk in line with the word of God. It's established, it will come to pass if we meet the conditions. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 7 also God's view of a covenant, and we also see about conditions. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God. He's faithful. And notice, it says he keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. When it speaks about keeping covenant, this particular word here is a, in the mood in the, he, in the Hebrew is a participle active which refers to ongoing action. Otherwise, he's a faithful God who is continually keeping his covenant, always, and mercy. But notice also, it says, with them that love him, this is for the ones who have their responsibilities. And this is also a participle active, meaning that those who are continually loving him, meaning that he's only going to keep continually his covenant and mercy with those who are continually loving him. And also, same thing with the word keep here. It also is, again, the participle active, indicating one who is keeping ongoingly his commandments. So this shows what God will do he will continually keep covenant and mercy, but it also shows what you and I must do. We must continually be loving him and continually be keeping his commandments, which is what shows that you really love the Lord. There are conditions. That means that his keeping of covenant and mercy is not going to come to pass for someone who does not continually love him and continually keep the commandments of the Lord. Down in verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. God expects you and I to be hearers and doers of the word. Remember, it's not a one-way street. It's not some unilateral thing. God will just do this regardless of what you do. This is, unfortunately, the problem in much of the teaching that goes forth today where they think that God's in control of all things, and that whatever God says is going to automatically happen, the irresistible grace, that kind of teaching, it is all a lie. It is a false teaching. It has all come from people that do not understand covenant relationship, and they've fallen into the lies of Calvinism and all these different ones. Totally deceived. No, it's not a one-way street. Covenants, promises only get performed when conditions are met. They have to be met. We also see in 2 Chronicles, chapter 6, verse 14. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Again, this is talking about God's promise. He says he's going to keep covenant continually, the participle active, ongoing action. But notice, he's going to show mercy. But then notice it's these servants that walk before him with all their heart. Well, here's the condition for uh, the party who has to keep these conditions to see God perform the covenant and the mercy. Again, a participle active, very important. When you see this, it's talking about ongoing action. So it's talking about those who are continually walking before him with all their heart. 
That's why you got to give them your heart. That's why you got to have the walk. The walk shows forth whether you're really following the Lord or not. What we say is great, but what we do shows we mean what we say. We cannot just have the sp spoken words coming out of our mouth. We must have the walk. We must have the action. We must be doing the word. We must have the fruit or the works that we have talked about. You see, you've got to understand, in covenant relationship, in the New Testament, you and I have been purchased. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's. You are to glorify God because you're bought. You are now bought. And you are a purchased possession. That means you can't walk in your own ways whatsoever. Ephesians 1.14, speaking of the Holy Spirit which, when you receive him, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. He has purchased you. He purchased you with his blood shed, which brought covenant relationship, him into a covenant relationship with the Father, the blood covenant, and it bought you at the same time. You have been purchased by redemption. You have belonged to him. You're not your own. We must understand that we are purchased. Therefore, we must walk in his ways if we're going to see the blessings come to pass. We also see that the covenant, it says in Genesis chapter 7, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee, which is speaking of Christ, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. He will be a God unto you. And notice, it is a long duration, everlasting covenant to the end of the age, continually. Be the time. And when we see that the Father will come at the very end and establish the eternal age where we dwell with him and live with him forever, praise God. We also see over in Psalms 105, that's Psalms, Psalms 105, verse 8, God has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. So how is this covenant working? What is this covenant? It's the word of the covenant the things that he has spoken and given forth. And notice, he remembers his covenant, the word which he's commanded. It's the word of God, which covenant he made with Abraham and his, and his oath unto Isaac. He also makes an oath. God made an oath. An oath is making, a, is a declaration, a promise, swearing essentially that you will perform something. It seals the relationship of the covenant promises and the blessings that they will come to pass in a person's life. That's what an oath is all about. He made an oath. In making an oath, he declared the fact that he would absolutely do it under no circumstance would he ever break his covenant whatsoever. It means oaths were made to show absolute certainty of the performance of that which he's promised. We see Genesis chapter 26. Verse 3, he said, Sojourn in this country, in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham my father. He said, I'm going to perform this oath that I made. It's got to be done. He took an oath that he would carry this out. He's going to perform it for sure. Absolutely. We see also in Psalms, We saw this for a moment here, where we didn't really comment on that very much. But he made also an oath, it says, to Isaac. The covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac that he would perform the promises and bring these things to pass. So a covenant is an unbreakable agreement on God's part. And he has sworn by himself. He has made an oath. It is a verbal promise, this oath is, and what he has said, the word, that absolute certainty of what God has said will be fulfilled. Now, why did God make oaths? It's so that you, not, he, not, he didn't have to. He did it for man's understanding that absolutely there's no reason that man would never believe God. 
He made an oath that he would perform the word. It means he's got to do it. And it's for man's benefit to believe that God will absolutely perform the promises of God. If you break a covenant, a curse will come. That's another thing we have to understand. It's not just blessings only. We see in 2 Samuel chapter 21, there was a famine in the days of David three years. Well, that's a curse. It's not a blessing. Year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. So, you know, why did this happen? Why are we having this curse? And the Lord answered, it's for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. Well, what was it about the Gibeonites? Remember in Joshua 9? They did it. It was wrong to do, but nonetheless they did it. They made a covenant with the Gibeonites that they would not slay them. Well, even though it was the wrong thing to do and the Gibeonites lied, nonetheless, when you make a covenant, it's set. And so, Saul, did he honor that covenant? No. He slew the Gibeonites. So a curse came upon him because of the disobedience. God wants us to understand that God will perform his word. When you understand covenant relationship, you should never doubt, you should never get into unbelief, you should never draw back from anything, you should always believe what God says will come to pass, knowing his promises will come to pass. We see further about God's attitude and what he will do. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, shall he not do it? If he said it, he'll do it. Hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? If he spoke it, he has promised that he will make it good. And does the Lord change? No. The Bible talks about it's down at Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. It declares, For I am the Lord, I change not. He doesn't change. What he has set, it's set. He will absolutely perform his word. We see the same thing over in the New Testament, speaking about Jesus and the things that he will perform. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, Today and forever, he performs the promises. Remember, he is the head over the church. And remember, he is the one who is at the right hand of the Father. He's the one in the high priestly ministry who will carry out that ministry in bringing forth the things in the New Testament to pass as you and I meet the conditions. We see in Hebrews chapter 6 what God did. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Saying, surely, and this word surely means most certainly, absolutely, no question about it. Bless, in blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. That's a promise he's made. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. They're talking about Abraham. Now, talk, patiently endured talks about long-suffering. And this is true, too, in your situation. There's long-suffering involved because you have an enemy who's trying to hinder you. It's the devil. And you have to conquer the devil and overcome him. That's why things don't happen immediately. Long-sufferingly, he endured, and then he obtained the promise. Men verily swear by the greater, and in, for, and for an oath of, for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise. And who's the heirs of promise? You and I are. When we're born again, we are become a son or a daughter, and we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. The immutability, the word immutability, means that which is fixed and unalterable. It's fixed. It's set. It's unalterable. Of his counsel confirmed by an oath. God's oath, the will that he has set forth, the covenant is fixed, as it says here. It is unalterable. He will not change anything. We see quite a statement that happened when the Israelites had rebelled against God and they had begun to worship the false gold calf. Exodus chapter 32. Here's when the people, verse 1, saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. 
As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what's become of him. Aaron said, Break off the golden earrings and the ears of your wives, sons, and daughters. Bring them unto me. And all the people broke off all this in their ears. They brought them to Aaron. What did he do? He made a golden calf out of it. He made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> what a lie. And so they were now involved in idolatry. And so... They're carrying on this way. And down in verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Notice, he didn't call them my people. He called them your people <laughs> because of what they had done. <laughs> Brought out of the land of Egypt, corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. Sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said unto Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them. And remember, the breaking of a curse is death. He could kill them all in righteous judgment. That I may consume them and I'll make of thee a great nation. We're going to start over with you. Moses besought the Lord as God said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which is brought forth, you, you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Moses is telling him, Change your mind, and don't do this. Why? Now he says, Why? Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self. That's covenant. And says unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented. He changed his mind of the evil which he thought to do unto his people, even though he had a right to do it because they broke covenant. When he reminded them and brought the covenant before him, he changed his mind. That's quite a statement. Why? Because of the covenant. Covenant, relationship. Is how God deals with you and me as how he's dealt with man ever since we began to make covenant relationship. Now, how does this work? The covenant it works through the word of God. We saw in Psalms 105 verse 8 before it was the word that he commanded to a thousand generations. We see there's many scriptures that talk about this. In Haggai chapter 2 and verse 5, he said, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Otherwise, he's referring to the covenant that I made. The covenant, the word that I covenanted with you. God pays attention to the word that he's covenanted with. We see over in Exodus, in chapter 34, it's the word. This is why you hear us emphasize the Word of God all the time. Because that is the word of the covenant that God's going to perform. Exodus 34, 27, The Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. He was there with the Lord forty days, forty nights, and neither did he eat bread nor drink water. He wrote upon tables the words of the covenant, which were the Ten Commandments. The word of the covenant is what... God is going to perform. And how about this word? This word will never fail. You need to know that God's word will absolutely come to pass. It will stand. It doesn't matter what situation comes. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. God's word will never fail. It will stand forever. And what are you supposed to do with the word? You're going to return the word to him when you pray the word or speak forth the word. And it's going, what's going to happen? It says in Isaiah chapter 55, speaking of uh, verse 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it's gone forth out, it shall not return unto me void. Who returns it to him? You and I do. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word will come to pass. 
as you, he, things he speaks will. And when you and I return the word to him, which is how we get it activated in our life, that's why we pray the word. Don't pray the problem. Pray the word of God. The word is what he is going to respond to because that is what he's going to perform, the covenant promises in your life. Now we must know about God's word. God's word's been tested. Proverbs 30, that is. Verse 5. Every word of God is pure. The word pure is not a good translation. It doesn't mean it's holy. It means something that has been tested and, and proven true. It's something that's been refined or tested. That's why it's tried or tested. Young's brings out the better understanding. Every word of God has been tested, tried. It's absolutely the truth. Absolutely will come to pass. It's already been through the testing process. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. You need to believe God's word and know that will always come to pass. John, John, John chapter 17, verse 17, speaks of his word. Sanctify them through thy truth. That's going to bring you to the place of being holy. Thy word is truth. Truth also can mean reality, that which is reality. His word is reality. It is the truth. And that is what he will bring to pass in your life. Everything that God does is going to be according to the word. That's why anybody that hears something and it's contrary to the word, they've been deceived by the devil. And we see lots and lots of people out there being deceived. They hear such and such. It's not in line with the word whatsoever. Psalms 33 verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right and all his works are done in truth. All of his words are always going to be done in line with the word of God. Even the Holy Spirit, he takes the things that he receives from above and brings them to pass. He doesn't originate anything. He always responds to the word of God. When you understand this, you should have absolute faith and never doubt that God will perform his word in your life. Psalms 119, verse 89. Forever thy word. O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. This particular word settled means that which stands firm. It stands firm continually. Because again, it's a participle active. It's a participle here. Continually stands firm, ongoing. It'll never fail. God's word can absolutely be trusted in. In fact, God's word will lead you in everything you do. Psalms 119, 105. The word's a lamp unto your feet, a light into your path. Don't ever go out and do things if you haven't seen if it's in line with the word. That's why we always hear us saying, what does the word say? We should be saying in every situation, what's the word say I should be doing before I go doing it? Otherwise, you could be off track. We have so many people that have been led astray and gone off in all kinds of directions, and they wonder why they got off that way. They a lot of times want to blame God. I wonder why God allowed me to go off in this direction and look at the mess I made. Well, if you'd have thought about what the Word says, you'd have never done it to begin with. God's Word is His covenant. It is what you and I are to walk by and live by. We see quite a statement made here in Psalms 38, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy Word above all thy name. He magnified His Word even above His name. The name is about who He is. His word is more important than even his name. He magnified it. God magnifies the word. And you have to know that he will perform it as we've seen. Here's another scripture it's important for you to know. There's a scripture we speak and quote and stand on all the time. Jeremiah 1.12 Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. The word hasten is a word which means to, to keep watch of. He's alert to perform it, to keep watch of this particular word. And again, participle active, meaning that he watches over continually his word to perform it. I mean, God's not sleeping, he's not slumbering, he's not uh, on a vacation. He's always ready to perform his word at all times. And he will continually watch over his word and he will absolutely perform it. 
We see another scripture. These are all covenant statements, see. Covenant, covenant declarations of what God will do. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It is very interesting when it says here about shall not pass away, it actually literally means might not pass away. The reason is because it's a subjunctive mood. Why would that say that my words might not pass away? Because God has to perform them all. That's the condition. Will God perform them all? Yeah, he will. But that's why it's in the subjunctive mood. Heaven and earth will pass away, and it will, because that's been set. His words will not pass away because God is going to perform them. And you need to have absolute confidence what he will do. When you understand covenant relationship, and you know that God has sworn by himself, he's given an oath, absolutely, no doubt about it, he will perform his word. But the thing you have to understand is there are conditions to be met. And it's not just take one scripture, oh, and I met that condition and that's it. No, it's all the scriptures on a particular subject. You can't just take one scripture and jump on that and think that everything's going to be fine without meeting the conditions of all the scriptures. This is why we have to know the word. And we have to know our covenant. We have to know our covenant responsibilities that are revealed in the word of God. Look, look at this for example here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, well, that would be our condition, then your heavenly Father also will forgive you. And he will do this. This is future tense. That means it's a guaranteed thing. If you meet the condition, you forgive men, he'll forgive you. But then, if you forgive not men their trespasses, oh, that meant you haven't met the condition, what's necessary for you to see God forgive you. Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And this, again, is a future tense, meaning it is a straight statement from God, no condition about it. God is not going to forgive anybody who will not forgive men their trespasses. And in light of this, thinking on this, that shows the conditions, many people have not understood 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins in the King James, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most people have thought, well, I'll just confess my sins and then I'm automatically forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. Is that so? No. How can you say that? It's what it looks like it says. First of all, if we confess our sins, now that's a conditional statement, isn't it? And that's why it's in the subjunctive mood. We do need to meet that condition of confessing our sins. Does that mean that we're automatically forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness? It looks like it. What about the verse we just read? If I confess my sins, hey, I sinned, but I didn't forgive my brother, am I going to be forgiven? We already know we're not going to be. So there's conditions to meet, aren't there? And actually, this is a poor translation. He's faithful and just. And when it says to forgive, to forgive is an infinitive, just like to cleanse would be an infinitive. Is this an infinitive in the Greek? No. It is a subjunctive mood verb statement here which is conditional. The subjunctive mood is a conditional statement. Conditions have to be met. In other words, if we might confess our sins, he's faithful and just, that he might forgive us our sins if we meet the conditions. And how about the cleansing part? Same thing. Subjunctive mood. Conditions. This is why Young's, that he may forgive us our sins, that he may cleanse us. Otherwise, if you read Young, you sit there and say, well, if I confess my sins, that doesn't mean he necessarily is going to forgive me or cleanse me. That's right. Because you've got to meet the conditions. If you don't meet all the conditions, you're not going to be forgiven. And you're not going to be cleansed. There's other conditions than just saying that I sinned. Like we saw in Matthew 6. You'd have to forgive someone. You have to have a, come to the place of repentance and turn away from these things. So otherwise, we've got to understand, this just shows you all these statements throughout the Word of God are conditional statements. They're covenant statements, aren't they? It's covenant. It's all about covenant relationship. Here's another one. 
we should understand that these are all covenant statements. In fact, the entire Word of God is all revelation of covenant relationship, if you understand what's being said. James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. If you draw nigh to God, you did your part. And what will happen? He will draw nigh to you. And this is a statement that's not a conditional statement. When it's a future tense, that means it shall happen. What's your condition? Draw nigh to God. So God will always draw nigh to you if you draw nigh to Him. You met the condition. We need to meet the conditions of the Word of God. Psalms 84. And again, it's not just some conditions, it's all the conditions of the Word, as we saw in that previous about the forgiveness one. Psalms 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. There is a condition here, isn't it? Walking uprightly. And we talk about walk. This is the participle active again, walking continuously. And when it speaks of uprightly, this is the word which means well, talking about someone who's come to being without blemish, perfect, upright, without spot, completeness, perfection. That's what this word's all about. Otherwise, you can't think that he's going to bring his grace and glory on those people that aren't walking uprightly. There's the condition. As you and I are walking, that's why you hear us talk about conquering sin, having our heart, perfect heart, and and getting our soul restored and our will set to choose the way of the Word and our mind, get the mind of Christ and, and walk in the ways of the Lord, conquer the works of the enemy and go on into holiness and, and be holy before the Lord in our life. That is absolutely essential. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the sovereignty of God teaching is a lie in the body of Christ. The sovereignty of God teaching basically teaches that God's in control of all things and whatever happens, it's God. Because he's sovereign, he's the king. Well, you have to understand, he is sovereign, but he made covenant with man, which is the way he deals with man, and he swore by himself, because he could swear by none greater, he bound himself to his word to perform it, and also man is also responsible to perform the word as well. So, is God just can do anything he wants, anytime he wants, however he wants? No. He's going to perform his word. Again, all these people, and this is a great amount of people in the body of Christ. They just think God, everything's God. I've heard lots of people. Well, I guess God must have wanted this such and such to happen. I wonder why God allowed me to get sick. I wonder why God allowed me, you know, these problems and that problems. God has nothing to do with bringing the evil things upon you if it's the work of the devil or through your own sins that opened up the door. There were conditions. Or if you didn't do the word that caused you to see the promise or to overcome the enemy in your life. If you don't bind the devil and you don't resist his temptations and you give place to him, what's going to happen? Destruction's going to come. You can't say that God was wanting these things to come to pass. Absolutely not. The, what is the judge also in the earth? It is the word. God said it so Everybody's under it, including himself. John chapter 12, verse 48. He that rejected me and receives not my words has one that judged him. The word that I've spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. What's going to judge all of us? The word of God. We have to put the word of God first place. And remember, there are blessings that come when you obey, but there's curses that come when you disobey. This is all covenant relationship. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. That is a true statement. If you and I will meet the conditions, the blessings will come on you and overtake you in your life. But what about if you don't? Verse 15, 
it shall come to pass. If you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Curses are going to come. We're breaking the covenant and not obeying and meeting the conditions that need to be met. And this has been seen, many people, you want to talk to someone and show them in history how this has happened in our own day. A good example is what happened to Israel. Israel did not obey the Lord, which was in the fact that they were supposed to sow the land for six years and then let the land rest a seventh year. They didn't do that. And because of that, they didn't do it for 70 years. They got punished uh, for, uh, in captivity for every year that they did not do this over a 490 year period time. So they went into 70 years captivity because every seven years they weren't doing it. And so therefore they went into captivity in Babylon for 70 years. <laughs> well, when they got out, did they repent and get it in line? No, they didn't. They continued to do it. Well, <laughs> they're in trouble. God says that when you, if you don't obey, you're going to have seven times more punishment. And that's exactly what happened to these guys. And it was revealed, actually, it's revealed in Ezekiel about the judgments that were coming upon the two different groups. There was the Israel with the northern tribes and then Judah with the southern tribes. Ezekiel chapter 4 in verse 3. Moreover, take unto thee an iron pan, set it for a iron wall of iron against thee in the city, and set thy face against it. It shall be a siege, and you'll lay a siege against it. This will be a sign for the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, that th th thou shalt bear their iniquity. He's telling them how long the iniquity is, curse is for them because of their disobedience. I've laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. They had to bear it for 390 days. When thou hast accomplished them, lie again on the right side. You'll bear the iniquity of the house of Judah that also had rebelled 40 days. So there was 90, the, the 390 and also the 40 days. If you add those together, that's 430 years of punishment for their rebellion and their iniquity. They had already served 70 of it in Babylon. 430 minus 70 is 360 years. But because they didn't repent after they came out of Babylon, the penalty is seven times more. So 360 years left of punishment times seven is 2,520 years of judgment that was going to come upon them as they were destroyed. They couldn't have be a nation during that particular time. When you look at prophecies and you figure them based on God's calendar, which are 360 days for figuring time of prophecies, and you multiply the 25, 20 years, 2,520, times 360 days, you come up with 907,200 days of judgment. If you divide that by our solar year to figure it in years, 365.25 roughly solar year, you come up with 2,483.78 years. That they were a nation till 606 BC. They got punished for 70 years. They got released from Babylon in 536 BC. If we go from 536 BC and we go 2,483.78 years, and the way you figure the calendar from 536 B.C. to 1 B.C., that's 535 years. There's no zero year. You went from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., that's one year. Then from 1 A.D., you add up the rest of this, which if you take the 2,483 years minus the 536 years, you have 1,947.78 years, roughly, from that time. This is what in the fall, when all this was pronounced on them. So what does that equal? It equals 1948 and some uh, portion for a year. Where does that bring them to? 1948. What happened in May 14th, it was, in 1948? They were able to become a nation again. 
Why couldn't they become a nation before? Because of God's punishment upon them for the, all this time because they rebelled against God. Otherwise, God is a performer of his word. Exactly. And it wasn't just for that. What happened also in 587, 606 is when they went into captivity, but they didn't, Jerusalem didn't fall until 587 BC, which was 19 years later. Let's add 19 years to uh, 19, 1948. What's that bring you to? 1967. What happened in June of 1967? They got Jerusalem back. They couldn't get it before then because of the punishment. In other words, God's word is the truth. This wasn't just an arbitrary thing. This was all according to the word of God. They could not become a nation until 1948. They could not get Jerusalem back until 1967 because of the penalty, the curse that was upon them. God's word is the truth. Looking at that, you can see, wow, God is a performer of his word. No question about it. God wants us to understand about covenants. Now, you and I come into covenant relationship the day we get born again. We receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. What happens? We become a new creation. We're brand new on the inside of us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or a new creation. The same word for creation. Old are passed away, not things. It's not in the Greek. They just put it, it can be translated that way, but it's talking about old or passed away, which is your spirit, the old spirit, and all, behold, all are become new where? In your spirit. The reason it can't be old, old things or all things are become new because, did you get a new body? No. Did you get a new soul? Mind, will, emotions? No. What'd you get? Only a new spirit, a new heart, it says. Therefore, that's what it's talking about. Not all things, but all that's referred to in the realm of the Spirit. And we got brand new. You've come into covenant relationship with Him. What did you get when you got born again? You got a new spirit. Galatians 4, 6 says, Now your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of His sons into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. We now have relationship with Him. He is our Heavenly Father, and we are now a son. And what are we supposed to do immediately? We are supposed to receive the first part of the promise of coming into covenant relationship with him. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation. We got born again. In whom also after that you believed, this is afterwards, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What's the Holy Spirit? A promise. Who gets a promise? When you're born again. And what is this promise? is the earnest. What is the earnest? It's like earnest money when you make a purchase. That's the first thing that you do, right? You put your money down or make a purchase. So this is like the first fruit of our inheritance. What should happen for every Christian once they get born again? They should immediately be told in the Word and prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit immediately. First thing. Most of the body of Christ has not done that because they thought they had the Holy Spirit when they got born again. When they didn't, they got the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit is received after you're born again as a promise. And notice, it's part of our inheritance and you can't get inheritance until you're born again. If a son, then an heir, the heir of God, join heirs with Christ. So, you and I are to receive the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And we are to understand that we have come into covenant relationship with him. Now we're going to have just a few minutes left. We're going to, in Hebrews, there's tremendous information about the covenant relationship. We pick up in verse 6. Speaking of Jesus, who brought this covenant into being, now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he's the mediator of a better covenant. Are we under the old covenant? No. We're under the new covenant, a better covenant, which was established, or this word means enacted laws. It's the word nomo, which comes nomos, which means law, and theto, which refers to something that's been enacted. Enacted laws are laws that have been put into operation because the New Testament has laws. All the people out there and say, well, we're not under the law anymore. 
Oh, yes, you are. You're under the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. We're not under the Old Testament law. We're under grace, which has laws, which is the, the law of Christ. Established upon better promises. We have these tremendous promises now. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Was there something wrong with the first covenant? Yeah, what was wrong? They couldn't keep it. It was between man who wasn't right and he couldn't keep it and he would break it all the time. He had to have a covenant that would be between two parties that would never break it, a perfect one. Finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not. They broke it, saith the Lord. This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, and this is the New Testament. Saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. God's word is being written in your heart and written in your mind, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Everybody can know him. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their... This is really the word anomia, which means lawlessness. Will I remember no more? <laughs> Praise God. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away or be disappearing. And that's exactly what's happened here. The one that decays, it's ancient old, waxes old, it's obsole obsolescent. If something's obsolescent, you know, it's, you know, you don't have anything more to do with it. It's done. This covenant is finished. It's amazing how people will go back and follow the old covenant law ways. What a mistake. We got whole groups of Christians out there that are doing this. They're totally deceived. Then verily the first covenant also had its ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. It was made for man after the flesh with well, all of its fleshly outward ordinances. But that wasn't what God purposed whatsoever. Instead, this is, it speaks here about all, the, all these things. It talks about, in verse 8, how the Holy Spirit signifying that the way in the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Nobody could go in there except for the high priest once a year to pour out the blood. It was a covering over of sin, not in a doing away of it whatsoever. It was a figure for the time then present, pointing towards this new covenant that was going to come to pass that was prophesied by Jeremiah that they should have, the Jews should have never missed. There were, and he says that they could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. But then it tells what Jesus did. In verse 11, Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then he says in verse four, how much, 14, how much more? So the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. He's accomplished this great work. Over in chapter 10, it speaks further. The law had a, was a shadow of good things to come. It never was the reality. It was only pointing toward it. The law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect, which is what the new covenant does. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But they did. Come down to verse 7. This is what Jesus came to do. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And what did he come to do? Verse 9, he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. He finished the first, as he was the final sacrifice for sins on the first, and he established the second. The first has been eliminated it has been taken away. It has been abolished. This word really means to take away or to abolish. The Old Testament has been abolished. The New Testament now has come into force. And it is what you and I are now to walk after. 
we see over here in verse 12, this man, when he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, as you and I conquer them all. By one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is talking about what you and I are doing because this is not past tense, are sanctified. This is a present tense, meaning that those who are being sanctified as we are working out our salvation, going on to perfection in the Lord. And then he says, This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts, and their minds will I write them. Their sins and their lawlessness will I remember no more. He's accomplished this great work. Jesus has done it. You and I are now in the New Testament, the New Covenant. That's the only one that he recognizes. That's the only church that he recognizes now. It's, well, because Jesus founded the church, the cornerstone of it. Hebrews 12, 22 says, We're coming to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. What's the church? The church of the firstborn. There's only one church. You have to be born again to get into it, otherwise you are not in it which are written in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, have gone into perfection, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. He is the mediator of the new covenant. He has the high priestly ministry at the right hand of the Father. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than of Abel's, which called for judgment, instead ours call, his calls for mercy, because of the new covenant now that is brought into being. Jesus is the mediator of this covenant. In fact, now we need to meet the conditions of it. So he says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape, escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Remember, we're in covenant relationship. That means we've got to meet the conditions. You can't ignore what he's told you to do. How many people know about all the commandments of the New Testament? All the laws of Christ, people don't even talk about it hardly. No, we've got to walk according to the commandments of Jesus Christ and follow his ways. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he's promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. In this word, yet once more signifieth the removing of things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. If you can be shaken, you're going to be in trouble. But if you won't be shaken, you'll remain. And what's going to be shaken? That which is of the Lord, while you're walking in line with the word of the covenant. You're following the way of the word. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For God is a consuming fire. There still are judgments. This is why we've got to walk in line with the word of God. And put the word first place. We'll look at two last scriptures before we stop for this morning. Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. After he accomplished redemption, he's raised from the dead, first born from the dead. The great shepherd of the sheep. He's now the head of the church over all the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. We're in blood covenant relationship. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Now we've come into the new covenant, a better covenant, better promises. We can possess every promise. We can enter into a spiritual rest. We can conquer every enemy. We've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. We can be delivered. We can be healed. We can be blessed in all ways. Jesus was sent to bless us, to bring forth all these great promises, and to bring us to perfection working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. We now have the perfect covenant, the new covenant, covenant that you and I have entered into. But we have to walk according to the ways of the new covenant. This is why we have to know what the word says and we have to fulfill the responsibilities of the covenant. When we do it and we know what God says he'll do, he absolutely will do it. This is why you and I can have absolute faith it wasn't in, faith wasn't in the Old Testament, a couple of places where it's used, but faith is nothing. Faith, they had to trust, but they are in the place of faith. Faith knows what God will do. 
Because how can we come to that? Because of the fact that we come in a relationship with him, we know him, we're now in the reality of relationship with him, we now can walk in line with the word, we now can conquer all sin, because sin has no dominion over us, we can conquer every enemy, we can walk in the ways of the Lord, we can possess every promise. All the promises have been given to us. We've already been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. It's all in the, doc, doc, the document of the New Testament, which is in heaven, reserved for us all these promises that you and I are to take hold of. So what do we got to know? You've come into covenant relationship. And that's the way God functions in everything. You've got to know the promises, and you've got to know exactly what he will do. If you meet all the conditions, not just one, you can't just take a scripture and jump on that and then forget about everything else. That's what a lot of people have done. I wonder why it didn't happen. I thought I did this scripture. What about all these other ones over here? Like the guy said, I confess my sins. Well, did you forgive your brother over here? No. Did you meet the conditions to be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness? Uh, no. No wonder you're still in the state you're in. Otherwise, you've got to meet all the conditions. That's why we teach you all the scriptures on subject after subject, and we don't leave anything out, because you and I've got to know it all, and we're going to learn it all. And you can learn it all, and God takes that word, writes it in your heart, writes it in your mind, brings revelation of his ways, and as you're a hearer and a doer and a hearer and a doer, it's in you. Just think of how much word's in you already. A lot of word is in you if you've been around here for a while, and you've been doing it. And you have a lot of things that God's done, and he wants to continue to get us so established in the word and walking in his ways and continuing in it, we will see every promise come to pass in our life because of covenant relationship. But remember, everything you have is his, and everything he has is yours. If you hold back, he has to hold back. Remember, he says, I love them that love me. You don't love him, you know, you're not going to see anything happen. How you treat God is how he's going to treat you. We've seen that time and time again in the scriptures. Covenant relationship is absolutely essential. You understand it. You know what God will do. You see your responsibilities. You're a, total, a doer of it. You will see God bring all these great promises to pass in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that brings revelation of covenant. I thank you. The Bible's all about covenant relationship. I have come into covenant relationship by receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. I got the Spirit of Christ, the one who made the covenant with the Father. So receiving His Spirit brings me into that covenant. I am in covenant relationship with the Father. I have all these promises that God has given in the Word that He will perform. There's also covenant responsibilities that I must meet and perform in my life to meet the conditions to see God accomplish all these promises in my life. I thank you. I will learn what the Word says. Understand the covenant. Understand my responsibilities and what God's responsibilities are. As I do my part, God will do His part and I will see the promises of God coming to pass in every area of my life. Thank you for understanding covenant relationship. I will always be mindful that I am in covenant with God and that the word of God is the word of the covenant. So I will be a hearer and a doer of the word so I will see all the covenant promises come to pass in Jesus' name. Amen. See, everything in the word is all about covenant. This made me think as we were just finishing that. Remember what says, become continual doers of the word and not hearers only, or you deceive yourself. What, 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 what would be good if you just were a hearer of the word? Are you doing the responsibilities? No, you heard it, but you didn't put it in operation. And you think, well, I heard it, so that must be okay. So you deceive yourself because you haven't fulfilled the covenant responsibilities, so God can't do anything for you. You're a forgetful <laughs> hearer, and you're going to get wiped out by the enemy. And you won't see the promises come to pass. They're all covenant 
statements throughout the Word of God. We've got a lot to talk about on this subject as we're going to be going through many things in regards to covenant relationship. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We thank you for the understanding of covenant and our responsibilities, and we will find out every responsibility we have and every promise that you've made, and we will walk in line with the Word, and we will see you bring everything to pass in our life. Thank you for the performance of your covenant in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.